Good morning, church. Um, welcome to Jesus House Second Service. Um, we would also like to wo- um, welcome those who are watching online. Can we start the service with a word of prayer? Thank you. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies that are fresh each morning. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, we just commit this service into your hands. We ask that um, we just we lift up the worship team into your hands. We, 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 we ask that the worship is pleasing to you, Heavenly Father. Father, we also um, lift up the word into your hands. Father, we ask that you open our hearts to receive your word today. Father, we ask that you challenge us for the weeks, the months ahead, Heavenly Father. And may your spirit go with us for us to bring revival into this land. Father, we thank you once again for your presence. And we ask that we bring glory to your name in all that we do. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Would you lift your hands to God and just give Him glory right now? For you deserve the glory And the honor Oh God, we lift our hands in worship As we praise your holy Like you, you, you. 
your hands and give him glory right now. Everywhere. Come on. We told the first service, and the Bible said, give unto the Lord the glory due his name. It's time to pay your dues right now. Come on. Give God the glory. We serve a God who reigns above all. His kingdom shall reign over all the earth because he is the ancient of days. Hallelujah. Blessing and daughter, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, now before the ancient of days. Everybody, blessings and honor. From every nation, all of creation, all of creation. One more time, blessings and honor. Say, blessings, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. Oh, from every nation. Thank you. 
Music, it's about your spirit. Come on. For the Father seek a son who will worship him in spirit and in truth. All over this room this morning. Oh Lord, we honor you. We honor you. We honor you this morning. We honor you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. Blessed be your most holy name, O oh God. Blessed be your name. 
Let your throne be lifted up, oh God. Yeah. Father, we worship you, oh God. Thank you, Master. Hallelujah. 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 Go on, just speak to God. Let us speak to God. Speak to him in the tongues of your understanding, in the tongues of the spirit. Speak to our most high God. Worship him with everything that we have. From the very depths of our being, worship Yahweh, our King immortal, our God of glory. Father, we lift up your name this morning, oh God. We lift up a cry out to you that you are God and God alone. Oh, we bless your name, Yahweh. Father, we worship you, oh God. King Jesus, we magnify your name, oh God. We magnify your name, oh God. Blessed be your name, oh God. Blessed be your name, oh God. For in Jesus' name we have worshipped. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. We'd like to pray for our United Kingdom, this nation, that there will be a revival in this land. Who wants to see a revival in the United Kingdom? Who wants to see a revival in the United Kingdom? Our God wants to see a revival in the United Kingdom. So as we pray, we want to stand on this scripture that this will be the confession of the people of this land. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21, in the New Living Translation, this will be their confession. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into his glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. This is our prayer this morning. We want to lift up our voices unto God. That, Father, you would touch the hearts of the people of the United Kingdom. That just as we confess this, that, Father, each and every one of them will confess that they are citizens of heaven, that they are their home is in heaven and they are eagerly waiting for him to come and raise them into that glorious body. Take them up into his holy presence forevermore, for eternity. Let us pray unto our God that he will do a new thing in, in our time. That he will touch the heart of every man, woman and child. That they will not love the things of this world, but they will begin to seek first the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God will come and take residence in the united kingdom. That every heart, O oh Lord, will be transformed it will be touched by the power of God by the Spirit of God that the confession of everyone shall be that we are looking forward to our home we are looking forward to our home like never before it is on our minds it is at the forefront of everything that we do morning and night we think of heaven afternoon we think of heaven in the workplace we think of heaven when we are cooking we think of heaven we are thinking of our God we are thinking of his presence we are thinking of the new heaven where there shall be no more evil where there shall be no more sorrow, where there shall be no more tears, where it shall only be the presence of God, where only God's presence shall be the light that we need, that we no longer need the sun, but we need only God's presence light. We need God, that the people will confess this, that will confess it from the depths of their being, that this will be their hope. Morning, afternoon and night, weekend and weekday, no matter where they go, this is their hope. Let us Pray, O oh, children of the Most High God, that this will be the confession of everyone in this land. Everybody in this land shall confess that we long for our King. We long for that day when we are in His presence. We long for that day where we are worshipping before Him day and night. 24-7 we are worshipping in His presence. Let us pray unto our God for He wants to do this same thing. Father, we bless Your name, O oh God. Father, we ask that you touch the hearts of the people, oh God. Touch the hearts of, of everyone living in this place. Touch the hearts of everyone dwelling in this land. Father, the way in which you can do it, only you can do it, oh God, where the people's minds will be transformed. Transformed that 
morning, afternoon, and night, they are looking unto heaven. They are looking unto your glorious throne. They are looking forward to that day, O oh God, when you redeem them from this body redeem them from this evil world oh god father we ask that you do this glorious thing in our time in the name of jesus father we ask that you do this mighty thing in our time in the mighty name of jesus we ask that you help us to be examples of this same hope help us to be examples of this hope oh god that our lives will mirror this confession that our lives will mirror everything that you have called us to be it will mirror everything that christ jesus is oh lord father Hear the cry of your people this morning, O oh God. Hear the cry of your children, O oh God, who cannot wait for that day, who are looking forward to that day, and who desire that you bring everyone in and around us into that same hope. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Still in an attitude of prayer, we'll be praying for the persecuted church. Those that are suffering, that persecution is their daily bread. That's their daily reality. Our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ that are being killed, that are being abducted, that are being imprisoned and tortured. Families that are being left in crisis, mourning for loved ones that they have lost, fearful of the future worshiping God in secret. Church, they need our prayers. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 verse 3, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. And as I was telling them in the first service this morning, when you have a headache or a heartache or even a toothache, your whole body feels that ache and every part of your body wants to get rid of that ache so your feet go to the doctors your hands take the tablets you swallow that you're trying to get rid of that ache we are part of that body that ache we're part of that um, per uh, persecuted church that is suffering and so we want to pray for them in the name of Jesus. We're going to be using Ephesians 1, 18 and Ephesians 3, 16, 17 to 19, which I will read for us. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you, that's the persecuted church, may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? That their hope will not fail in the name of Jesus. Ephesians 3, 16, 17 to, and 19. He would grant you, the church, the persecuted church, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith, that they being rooted and grounded in love, will know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So we're going to pray for them that their strength will not fail them in the name of Jesus. That God will strengthen them. That the Holy Spirit will overshadow them in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's begin to pray for our brothers and sisters that are suffering all over the world just because they love Jesus. Father, Lord God Almighty, we lift up the persecuted church, oh God. Father, we're asking, oh God, Father, Lord God, that you will strengthen them, oh God. You will strengthen them in their inner man, oh God. Holy Spirit, overshadow them, almighty God. Father, we are praying that their strength will not fail, O oh God, Father, in the time of adversity and persecution, O oh God. Father, Lord God Almighty, that you will cause them to be encouraged, O oh God. Father, that they will endure, they will have courage in the name of Jesus. That they will stand, O oh God, Father, Lord God, despite the pain, O oh God, Father. Lord God Almighty, that you will visit, O oh God, Father, Lord, with strength, O oh God, Father. That you will comfort those that are mourning, O oh God, Father. Families that are mourning, families that are torn apart, O oh God. 
God, that you will strengthen them, oh God. Visit them with your comfort, oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ, oh God. Father, we ask, oh God, Father Lord, that you will visit, oh God, Father, our brethren, oh God, that are suffering all over the world, oh God. We remember Leah Sharibu and her family, oh God, and use them as a point of contact, oh God, that all families, oh God, that have been touched, oh God, Father, with this kind of persecution, Lord, that, Lord, you will visit them, oh God, you will comfort, you will strengthen, oh God, that they will not give up, oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask, oh God, Lord, that you will visit, oh God, even the abductors, oh God, the persecutors, oh God, Lord, that you will change their hearts, almighty Father, Lord God Almighty, that even as they see, oh God, those that have been living the gospel, even in persecution, that their hearts will be touched, oh God, that Lord God Almighty, you will turn around their hearts, oh God, Lord, that you will remember them, oh God, Father, remove, oh God, Father, this evil from their midst in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray, oh God, Father, Lord God, that Lord, their hearts will be turned and touched, oh God, Father, that Lord, your spirit, oh God, Father, Lord, will reign in them, oh God, will be touched, oh God, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, that persecution, oh God, will come to an end in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you, oh God. We thank you, Lord. We are a God that answers prayers, oh God. Father, we know that even as we have called out, oh God, Father, Lord, that you will answer our prayers, oh God. That, Father, Lord, you will cause the strength not to fail, oh God. That their inner man, oh God, will be strengthened, oh God. That, Lord, they will have the grace to forgive, oh God, Father. That a root of bitterness, oh God, Father, will not be pulled up in, Lord, in their lives in the name of Jesus. Father, that you will turn around, oh God, Father, even the life of the persecutors, oh God, that Lord, they will begin to see your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we bless your holy name, oh God. We honor you, oh God. We thank you, Lord God Almighty. We give you glory, Almighty God, as you touch, oh God, Father, the persecuted church. Blessed be your holy name, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Please, can we be seated for seven news? Hello, I'm Caroline Newman, and welcome to this week's 7 News. As Christians, I'm sure that we readily assist anyone who needs our help. Here at Jesus House, every year we devote one week to provide an acts of service to members of our communities who need our help. These could be the elderly, the disabled, single parents or widows. Every year we receive dozens of testimonies from the grateful relatives and friends of people who have received our help. We provide services such as cutting overgrown hedges and gardens and generally clearing a space so it's easier for people to move around. This year's acts of service started yesterday and will continue until the end of the week. But we need more volunteers. If you can only devote just a couple of hours, that would be fantastic. Just go to our website, acts-uk.com and register there. And I'm sure that God will richly bless you. Two Become One are the premarital classes that we offer at Jesus House. These classes are compulsory for anyone who's planning to get married here. The classes run from Friday the 6th of September for nine weeks and it's an opportunity for you to come along to listen, learn and share in a supportive environment. You will need to register for the classes by emailing tightknots at jesushouse.org.uk. If you were to ask any successful person how they became successful, the chances are at some point they will say that they had a mentor. Here at Jesus House, we offer a special mentoring scheme for women. Esther's mentoring scheme is designed to provide a supportive environment to help women to achieve their full God-given potential. 
The next mentoring scheme starts on Tuesday, the 3rd of September at 7 p.m. here at Jesus House. You will need to register for this jhems.eventbrite.co.uk. But remember, the deadline for registration is the 17th of August. Parent Roundtable is a series of seven informal meetups for parents with children of all ages. The purpose of these sessions is to equip parents to raise God-connected children. The first session is being held on Monday, 16th of September at 7pm here at Jesus House. This first session is entitled Position for Influence and will enable parents to help their children to apply godly principles to everyday life. Registration is required, so please follow the link on the screen. Well, that's it for this week's 7 News. Here's a recap of this week's announcements. You can watch us again on our website, jesushouse.org.uk, or on our YouTube channel. And remember, we're social here at Jesus House. We're on all the major social media platforms. So like us, friend us, follow us, and engage with us there. Our social media handles are at Jesus House London and at Jesus House UK. Until next time, thank you and God bless. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, it's real privilege to be able to join in praying for the part of the body that's been persecuted and may God hear our prayers and answer our prayers. Uh, this morning as was said in, uh, or afternoon now, as was said in 7 News, Acts Week has started. It started yesterday and uh, we're really, really grateful for all the uh, volunteers who put their hands to the plow and went to serve and make a, a, a lasting difference in the lives of so many people. So Jesus House, can we please put our hands together and appreciate all of those volunteers who went out and served yesterday. Now, just in case you're not one of the people who went out to serve yesterday, it actually just started yesterday and it carries on tomorrow and runs all the way through to next Saturday. So really want to encourage us to sign up and be a part of Acts Week this year. It, it, it's amazing the impact, the difference that is made in the lives of people who we get to go and serve. Elderly people who cannot do the gardening on their own, uh, someone who's been in hospital and has just been discharged, is back home, uh, a single parent, all sorts of circumstances, all sorts of situations. And we've had uh, these people referred to us from several different agencies in the community and we get to go and serve the people. You know what's most interesting is the fact that beyond the garden or the transformation to people's homes that we make, a lot more important is the transformation that we as representatives of Christ can make to the lives of people. As we engage with the homeowners or the people who we are serving, it's amazing that we're not just you know, serving in the gardens, but we're doing so much more than that. And really, I want to commend it to each one of us to find uh, a few hours, half a day, a full day, and be part of it. Take a day off work. It, it, it's a service that I really want to commend. You know, as David said, uh, and Abraham as well, I will not give to God a sacrifice that did not cost me. And so if it's going to cost us uh, a few hours. Let's make that sacrifice. Just thinking about yesterday and all the people who came to serve, uh, I must say to the men that the women far outshined us. There were a lot more women out there serving than there were men. So I really want to encourage us. The Bible says the glory of the latter shall be greater than the former. So because we still have so many more days to go, there's so much opportunity for us to get involved. We particularly need drivers who are going to drive the volunteers, drive the tools uh, to the various homes. And so if you've got a clean license, uh, then please... <laughs> I had a chuckle there. Actually, 
if you've got up to six points on your license, which uh, you can still come and drive. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please do make yourself available to help with that in the coming week. I promise you, you think that you're going out to serve others and that you're going to help to impact the life of others. I promise you, your life will be the better for it. So, uh, looking forward to seeing all of you, or as many of you as the Holy Spirit convicts, <laughs> to come and be a part of that. And now I'd like you to join me, Jesus House, as we welcome the ministration of Pastor Sholai Ruku. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank God. Um, good afternoon, church. Well, first of all, I'd like us to, I'm sure you're wondering where the tribe of Judah are. Um, they're on a retreat. But I'd like us to appreciate the wonderful gift in Pastor Prince um, from Living Water Parish. There he is. Thank you so much, Pastor Prince. And um, Dami, um, Nela, Ibuku, and Louis on the drum. Thank you so much. Thank you for leading us in an awesome time in God's presence. And um, my husband says he sends his greetings. He's in sunny Lagos at Redemption Camp, but he'll be back soon, so yeah. Okay, the title of my message this morning is No Longer a Slave to Sin. And I'll start off by telling us a story. Now there once was a town high in the Alps that straddled the banks of a beautiful stream. The stream was fed by springs whose waters were clear like crystal. Children laughed and they played beside it. Swans and geese flew and skirted across the stream. The stream was so clear that you could see the rocks and the sand at its bottom. And rainbow trout could be seen swimming in the stream. There was an old man who served as a keeper of the springs. And his job was to travel from spring to spring, clearing all the clutter, removing the branches, the fallen leaves, the twigs, or any debris that might pollute the waters and cause it not to be as clear as it should be. His work was unseen. And then one year, the town council, as they typically do sometimes, they decided they had no money. And so they laid off the old man, the keeper of the stream, and so the spring was left unattended. And so twigs and branches, mud and silt, refuse, farm waste began to accumulate in the stream. And what was a clear stream suddenly became a stagnant bog, suddenly became a swampland. And for a time, no one in the village noticed that anything had changed. But after a while, the waters became smelly, they became brackish. They became salty, they became dirty, they became unpleasant. And then the swarms and the geese that used to fly down and skirt the waters didn't come anymore. And the water no longer had a crisp scent, and so the kids stayed away from it. And the sparkling beauty of the stream that used to flow between the banks of the town was lost. You know, over, over several years now as a church, we've been learning about the Holy Spirit. We've been learning about his personality, his role in our lives. We have been on a journey of developing a closer and an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. And in that journey, we've learned that the Holy Spirit can be described as a wind. He can be described as a fire. And often he's described as a river, stream of living water. John 4, 14 says, But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. But the water that I give him, Jesus speaking, will become in him a spring of water satisfying his thirst for God, welling up, continually flowing, bubbling within him to eternal life, speaking of the presence of the Holy Spirit. For like the stream that I described in the story previously, the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives is like a stream. It's a stream of living water that brings beauty to our lives. It brings clarity to our lives. 
It brings an appealing aura. It, became, it brings a sweet smelling fragrance that those around us see and they're drawn to the Holy Spirit, to the presence of God on our inside. It brings glory to God. But unfortunately, just like the story, there are things that can clog up that stream. It can prevent the free flow of the Spirit of God in our lives. It can prevent the overflow of God's Spirit. And today I believe the Holy Spirit, the keeper of the streams, is drawing our attention to the twigs, to the branches, to the mud, to the farm waste, to the debris, and other rubbish in our lives that can clog up the flow of the stream in our lives, that can cause the spring of living waters or the rivers of living waters, the Holy Spirit flowing through our lives, that can prevent it from a smooth flow, that can prevent it from being crystal clear, that can prevent it from being crisp. And those twigs, those branches, that rubbish, that debris, that farm waste is just an allegory of sin. And the effect that sin has on you and I's relationship with the river of living waters, the Holy Spirit. And you know another character about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And in John 16, 13, we are told that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will guide you and I into all truth. And so today I believe the Holy Spirit wants to lead you and I into the truth about what sin really is. And the impact that it has on our lives and the impact that it has on our relationship with him. I believe he wants us to understand how by God's grace we can lead a life that overcomes sin. A life of walking victoriously in abundance and the overflow of God's spirit. And so what things would he have us understand this morning? Firstly, I believe that he would have us understand that sin is an offense primarily and firstly against God. It's not firstly a sin against you. It's not firstly a sin against me. It is firstly and primarily a sin against God. For sin is a transgression of God's law. You know, when we sin, we either violate God's prohibitive commandments or we omit practicing his positive commandments. What do I mean by that? We violate God's prohibitive commandments. For example, he tells us, thou shall not steal. And so when we steal, we violate his prohibitive commandment, you shall not. Or when we omit to do his positive commandments, when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, or when he says, give to the poor, and when we don't do it, we omit to do his positive commandments, we sin. And you know, since God's law is a reflection of his holy nature, when we sin by transgressing, we offend him personally. And something that you and I must never forget is that we're not our own. Our lives are not our own. Our lives are God's. We are God's. Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and I'm reading the Amplified. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you? And whom you have received as a gift from God. And that you are not your own property. When we sin, we grieve the one, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us. For we are his temple. We are his dwelling place. You know, any relationship, any intimate relationship, any close relationship, the last thing you want to do is to offend the person. In a marriage, the last thing you want to do is to offend your partner. For offense within a relationship causes a drawing apart, it causes a separation, and it's the same with the Holy Spirit living on our inside. Ephesians 4.30, and I'm reading the Passion Translation, it says, So never grieve the Spirit of God, or take for granted His holy influence in your life. Or the Amplified says it like this, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please Him, by whom you and I were sealed and marked and branded as God's own. The second thing we must understand is that God is a holy God and that his character and nature is holiness. You know, God's speaking to Moses in the book of Leviticus 19.2 and he's speaking to you and I in Jesus' house today and he's speaking to those of you watching online. God's speaking to us, he's saying, speak to all the congregations, speak to the congregations of Jesus' house, the congregation watching online. And say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy, says the Lord. 
You know, from Genesis to Revelation, we see one of the desires of God, and it's to dwell with man. And we see it in the Old Testament, how the presence of God, the Spirit of God will descend. It will descend upon the tabernacle of meetings where Moses stood. And sometimes when he wanted a job to be done, we read how he descended upon Moses. His Spirit descended upon Joshua. His presence descended upon Samson. And they would go out and they would slay their enemies. But the difference then was that once the Holy Spirit had done his job, his work, his spirit went back. But God desired that he would come and tabernacle permanently with you and I. He would dwell with us permanently. But the challenge was how could a holy God, who the Bible says the heavens of heavens cannot contain, who the Bible says the angels cover their faces with their wings because they cannot behold his presence, how could a God who was so holy dwell in frail and sinful man? That was the challenge. The prophet Habakkuk in Habakkuk 1.13 said, But your eyes, speaking of God, are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. He cannot dwell where there is sin. He cannot dwell where there is evil. But he wants to pour out his spirit in you and I. He wants to overflow in his children. But sin stands as a barrier. Thirdly, we need to understand the deceptiveness of sin. You know, there's so many, several deceptions about sin. But because of time, I'll just highlight three. The first deception I believe that we need to understand about sin is an idea that sometimes we get that there is a grading in sin. Almost like swimming lessons, almost like music lessons that start from grade one when you're a beginner to grade eight. So it's almost like the lies, the jealousy in my heart is grade one. And then the murder and the killings and the gross misconducts are grade eight. But you know that's a deception of sin. For in God's eyes, sin is sin. There's no grade one, there's no grade four, there's no grade eight. In God's eyes, sin is sin. Whether it be lying, whether it be stealing, backbiting, jealousy, whether it be gossip, rebellion, pride, anger, worry, doubt. Whether it be murmuring, whether it be rebellion against authority, whether it be selfish ambitions, whether it be wrong motives of my heart, whether it be deception, whether it be slander, whether it be insincerity, whether it be unforgiveness, whether it be that I disrespect my parents, whether it be sexual immorality, whether it be addiction, whether it be my ego, whether it be bitterness, whatever name it is called, sin is sin. It has no grading in God's eyes. Another deception about sin is that it's in my heart and so it doesn't do any harm to anyone. What can a little envy do? What can a little jealousy? What can a little gossip between my friend and I do? What can a little backbiting do? What can a little murmuring in my heart against authority? What can it do? You know, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, the New Living Translation says, Catch all the foxes. Those little foxes before they ruin the vineyard of love. Or the Passion Translation puts it so eloquently, you must catch the troubling foxes. Those sly little foxes that hinder our relationship, speaking about our relationship with God. For they raid our body vineyard of love to ruin what I have planted within you, God speaking. God says, will you catch them and remove them for me? And he says, we will do it together. You know, I love that scripture. And particularly that TPT translation because it's an allegory that it makes us realize that our relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit, that the little sins, the hidden sins, the little foxes, they'll spoil that relationship. They will ruin that love relationship. But you know, I'm also encouraged that God sees the depths of our hearts. And in the words of the song by Chris Tomlin, in indescribable, he sees the depth of your heart, he sees the depth of my heart, and he loves me the same. But he loves me enough to not allow me to get away with what will separate me away from him. Encouraging words about God's love towards us, but he also confirms that God sees the depth of our heart. He sees what no one else sees, and that he wants us to deal decisively with them so that the flow of the Spirit of God in our hearts is not hindered. And you know, I know a lot about foxes. 
because my house, my garden has urban foxes. And you know, like sin, we've had them for many years. I think they've probably been there since we moved in there, 10 years now. But, you know, you came out, you could smell them, they were around, it didn't bother you. And then one day I woke up in the morning and I looked onto our garden and I saw them sitting on my garden like dogs. They had obviously taken territory. And one thing about foxes and like sin, it, they take territories. They mark it out. And I thought, wow, they're now sitting on my garden. And then one day I woke up and I looked out of my window and I saw a little fox. And it was the cutest thing ever. But isn't that how sin starts off? And I remember saying, oh my goodness, I need to get my phone. And my husband said, what are you talking about? It's a fox. And I said, but it's so cute. And then one day we woke up and our cars had scratch marks all over. The foxes that we had tolerated now were not just sitting on our garden. They were not just fouling up the garden. They were not just digging up my plants. But now they were jumping on our cars and scratching our cars and causing so much damage. That's why God says, deal with the little foxes. The third deception is that we believe that we can control sin in the flesh by our own effort. The belief that when I decide I'm going to stop that sin, I'll stop it. I just haven't decided to stop it. And I'm reminded of the heartfelt cry by Paul in Romans 7:15, And Paul says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Verse 17 says, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it. But it is sin living in me. And this scripture is not a shirking of responsibility by Paul, but it's a recognition that he wants to share with you and he wants to share with me that there is a powerful force behind sin. Fourthly, we need to understand the destructive nature of sin. And two stories in the Old Testament bring that really clearly to mind. The first is the story of Abel and Cain, the first twins that we hear about in the Bible. And as I'm sure a lot of us know that story, they brought an offering before God. And God accepted Abel's sacrifice. And he despised, the Bible says, Cain's sacrifice. And I guess what should have happened was Cain just goes back to God and says, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, I've sinned against you. I haven't offered the sacrifice as you said I should. But no, instead the sin stayed there. And the sin became anger. And the sin became jealousy. And the sin became rage. And after a while, that sin became murder. That's the nature of sin. The destructive nature of sin. You know, Genesis 4, 7, from that story, the NLT, and I love it. God spoke to Cain and said, you'll be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. For sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. Or as the Amplified Version says it, if you do well, God speaking to Cain and speaking to you and I, believe in me and doing what is acceptable and pleasing to me, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well but ignore my instructions, sin crouches at your door. Its desire is for you to overpower you, but you must master it. It's a warning to you and I of sin's destructive intent. That sin, sin aims to overpower us and to control us. It shows how sin grows and grows and grows and grows until it destroys. I'll tell us another story from the Old Testament about the children of Israel. You know, when they had walked through the, through the wilderness for 40 years and they got to the brink of, of, of the promised land and God was going to take them in. And God told Moses, he told Joshua, he told, you know what, this land before you, I've given it to you. No one will be able to stand with, before you. The Old Testament speaks at, at how the sheer mention of the children of Israel and God Jehovah used to put fright into the hearts of the, of the Philistines and, and the Jebusites and the Hivites and the Gergeshites and all of them. But God told them, but do not sin against me, do not break my law. Because the day that you break those laws, the people that used to run away from you will fight you and destroy you. And so God told them, go to Jericho, take over Jericho, I've given it to you. And they went. 
and God delivered Jericho into their hands. But God gave them clear instructions. He said, you're not to take anything. You can take the gold and silver and use it in my temple, but you must not take anything and you must kill everything. But Achan, from the tribe of Judah, decided for whatever reason that he would take some things for his personal gain. And he kept it. And God kept his promise, the battle of Jericho, they, de they defeated, they annihilated Jericho. And so the next place God told them to take over was Ai. And so they went to Ai as before. God had given them a promise. God had told them that he was going to conquer, that he was going to take them in. But they had forgotten that something had changed. Sin had entered into the camp. And so they go to I as before, that God has promised and will conquer. And when they got there, the children of I killed thousands of the children of Israel. It was unbelievable. And so after the, after, the, after the battle, they came back home and they cried and they wept. That, Lord, what had happened? And then God told them, and I'll read it. Rise up, and it's Joshua 6. It's Joshua 7 from 11 to 13. But I'll take out bits because of time. That is why the soldiers of Israel could not stand and defend themselves before their enemies. They turned their backs and ran before them because they had become accursed. I will not be with you anymore, says God, unless you destroy the things under the ban from among you. God speaking, rise up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, these are things under the ban among you, O Israel. You cannot stand victorious before your enemies until you remove the things under the ban from among you. The presence of sin prevented the Holy Spirit from coming down mightily upon them. Fifthly, we must understand the enemy of our soul, Satan. And his one objective is to deliberately and intentionally ensure that you and I are kept out of the presence of our God. To ensure that you and I do not enjoy the abundant life that John 10.10 10 says that Jesus came to give us life in his abundance. That intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, that is number one agenda. And his choice weapon for this is sin. He chooses sin because he's a spirit and he gets it. He understands the spirit realm. He understands that there is structure, there is order, there is hierarchy. He understands that God is God and while he loves us, he cannot tolerate sin and he must judge sin. He is the recipient of the judgment of God's God upon you because of sin. And so he understands that if he wants to obstruct that relationship, if he wants to obstruct the intimacy with the Holy Spirit, if he wants to stifle the overflow, he just needs to introduce sin. He also knows that he can go regularly and he does, reg and he does it regularly before the throne of grace and say, God, you can't do that because of sin. And that's why the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. But thanks be to God who causes you and I to triumph. For we're not helpless. We have victory over sin. You and I have victory over sin. And so the sixth truth is this. That you and I must understand and believe the revocable and the eternal truth that for as many of us who believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that we have been delivered and we have been set free from sin. And that the power of sin and its consequences is broken over our lives if we believe, we must believe. Because in the words of Apostle Paul in Romans 8-2, and I'm reading the NLT, because you belong to him, Christ Jesus, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. I'll read it to us again in the Amplified. For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new beginning has set you and I from the, free from the law of sin and death. And I'll read it again from the Passion Translation that for the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. Jesus said in John 8, 36, that he who the Son sets free is free indeed, is free from sin. And so sin shall not have dominion over you and I. In the mouth of two or more witnesses, a thing is established. You and I have been set free through Christ Jesus from sin. And you and I have to really believe this truth, that the power of sin is broken. Its right is entitlement. Its justification has been broken. We are set free. You and I are set free. 
I'm reminded of sometimes when you get a whale caught in a net and the whale is struggling and a deep sea diver will come and cut off the net, cut it off and take it off. And, and he's willing the whale to swim, to swim, to swim, you're free. But oftentimes you see the whale just sitting there, almost like he's, he's become bound in his mind. You and I, we are free. Jesus has cut the nets over our lives. We are free. We are free from sin. <laughs> Jesus opened the door when he hung on the cross. And our sins were nailed permanently on the cross. And you know, the same way we give our lives to Jesus Christ and we are delivered from hell and eternal damnation. It's the same way when we give our lives to Christ, we are delivered from sin. We are not slaves to sin. We are not. And today I've come to encourage someone, someone here today, someone watching online as I encourage myself that it doesn't matter what the sin is. It doesn't matter what it's called. It doesn't matter how long it's been there. It doesn't matter how many generations it's been in your family. For as long as you are a believer and you believe in Christ Jesus, the power of sin is broken. <laughs> and the seventh truth that we need to know is that as believers, when we come before the throne of grace and we come in the power of the blood of Jesus, Satan has no legal foot to accuse us. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is Romans 8.1. I love it. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation. There is no guilty verdict. There is no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus, who believe in him as personal Lord and Savior. Or the TPT says, so now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. For once we repent, uh, once we ask God to forgive us of our sins, once we plead the blood of Jesus, uh, God says to the devil, the case is closed, the case is closed. You can't accuse her, you can't accuse him anymore. The case is closed. And so someone listening to me today or somebody listening online will say, so shall I what next? How do I practically live in the reality of the truth that I've heard today? How do I disentangle myself from the net of sin? How do I disentangle myself from a sin that so easily besets? How do I disentangle myself from an addiction? How do I disentangle myself from an a habitual sin? How do I break generational sins that are dogging my steps and holding me bound? How do I? How do I strive to live a sin-free life that pleases the Holy Spirit so that he will dwell mightily in me? I believe the starting point is a knowing and a remembering that God is love. Oh, how he loves you and I. He loves us with an everlasting love. And that is why the Bible says in John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, will not perish because of sin, but have eternal life. You must remember that God loves you and I. And love covers a multitude of sins. And so because he loves us, he made a permanent way of deliverance from sin for us through his son, Jesus Christ. The second thing we must know is the knowledge of what Jesus achieved for us when he took on flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Bible talks about Jesus in Hebrews, that he's our high priest. And how he became a sin offering for us once and for all. The Bible talks about a high priest who understands our weaknesses. He sympathizes with our weaknesses. He empathizes with us because he walked amongst us like man. But the only difference between you and I is that he did not sin. But because he walked amongst us, he's able to feel how we feel. And so in modern day terms, he gets it. But he also understands the import of sin. He understands the impact of sin. And so he says, child, I love you. I understand what you're going through. But hey, I'm here to enable you to overcome the power of sin. Thirdly, we daily and continuously need to declare and enforce through our words the truth of his word. You know, I love the scripture in Galatians 5.1, and I read it from the Amplified and TPT again. Galatians 5.1 says, it was for this freedom that Christ set us free, completely liberating us. Therefore, keep standing firm. And do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery, which you once were removed from. Or as the TPT eloquently puts it, let me be clear, Paul speaking, 
The anointed one Jesus has set us free, not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. So we must confess and declare continuously by his word over our lives the truth of his word. That I am free, I am free. I am no longer a slave to sin. That the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has delivered me from the sin of the law, sin and death. For words have power. And the word of God has much power. And the word of God is spirit and is, and is life. And it creates and it restores. And it delivers and it enforces. And if we enforce and if we believe and if we receive our healing through our words and we enforce our prosperity through our words and we enforce our promotions and all the things we are believing for through our words, we need to enforce our deliverance from sin and all the works of sin through our words. We must declare daily that I am no longer a slave to sin. So you this sin, you cannot have dominion over me. We must declare it. I love the message translation of Romans 6, 11 to 14. And it says, from now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. That means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Hallelujah. Don't ever run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourself wholeheartedly and full time. Remember you have been raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Verse 14 says, sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you are not living under that old tyranny any longer. You are living in the freedom of God. And so our journey over the last few months as a church of developing an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit has seen us learning so much about his nature and his character. And in the journey of striving to live a sin-free life, today we see another character of the Holy Spirit. And that is the one who empowers us to overcome sin and to live a sin-free life. For the Holy Spirit, the revealer of the heart, is the one who makes us aware of thoughts of our hearts that displease and grieve him. It is the Holy Spirit, our intercessor, who helps us oftentimes in the spirit to pray prayers of deliverance that deliver us from traps and snares of the enemy. It is the Holy Spirit, our advocate, who pleads in the courts of heaven on our behalf and who silences the accuser of the brethren and says, no, the case is closed. It is the Holy Spirit who strengthens us when we find ourselves in times of temptation and dangerous situations. He strengthens us to resist those temptations and flee. And it's the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. The truth of his word that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all, un to cleanse us and to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And it is the Holy Spirit, our teacher, who reminds us who we are, who reminds us that we are loved by God, who reminds us that we are bought with a price, uh, who reminds us that we are God's, uh, who reminds us that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost and so sin should not have any dominion or have its part in our lives, that we are no longer slaves to sin. And it's the Holy Spirit who dwells on our inside, who empowers us to live a sin-free life. And we can do it. Because you know, God is just and he will never ask you and I to do anything that he hasn't made provision for. And the provision he has made is given him his Holy Spirit to help you and I, if we would just ask him to help us to live a life that is devoid of sin. And a life that when we do sin, we are quick to repent and ask God to forgive us. You know, Cain, God told Cain in that scripture we read earlier, Genesis 4, 7, that he, God told him that he can master sin. But it's not by power in the words of Zechariah 4, 6. It's not by power. It's not by might. It's not by force, it's not by strength, but it's by the Spirit of the living God. It is only through the help of the Holy Spirit and intimate relationship with Him where we are yielding and we're submitted to His way and to His will and to His commandments. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Lord, if you say sit, I sit. If you say stand, I stand. If you say don't go there, I don't go there. If you say don't do that, I don't do that. It doesn't matter what it looks like. If you say don't marry that guy, I don't marry him. It's all about me. If you say give my tithe and offering, I do it. It's obedience. It's about
about him. It's about yielding and submitting to the Holy Spirit's dictates. And you know, the Holy Spirit is also our standby, and I love that. And it means that he's always there with us. He's never leaving us. He's never forsaking us. He's always standing by. When he sees the trap, he pulls us back. When he sees the snare, he pulls us back. When he sees things that are set to hold us bound, he pulls us back. But we must be yielded and submitted to him. We mustn't be that, no, Lord, I'll do it my way or I'll do it halfway. No, we must be yielded and submitted to him. And so that way, he cleanses us by the blood of Jesus. And we're open for him to pour out his spirit like never before. That the overflow of God's spirit that we've been crying for since the beginning of the year, it will flow in our lives. That the keeper of the stream can release the dam in our lives, the overflow. That men and women, as we go to work, as we go to school, they will see us and they will see the Spirit of God in us. And they will see his glory. And so today, I'd like to make an altar call. And the first call is for anyone here. And if you're watching online and it applies to you, just pray by faith and the Holy Spirit is everywhere. And you know, the start of this journey of living a life that is free from sin, it starts with Jesus. Because the honest truth is that you can't know that you're sinning if Jesus, the word, is not making it clear that, child, what you're doing is not pleasing in my sight. So that's the starting point. And so today, if you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus, if you're dogged by sin and things that you're like, God, how do, I, how do I get out of it? There's power in the name of Jesus to break every yoke, to break every chain. But it starts with a relationship with him. And you know, the Holy Spirit is the one that draws us near. He's the one that draws us to Jesus and Jesus reconciles us with the Father. And so if you're here today, Jesus' house, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what your sin is. The Word of God says that if your sin be as red as crimson, as red as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. And so if you're out there today and you don't know Jesus, He's calling you. He's knocking on the door of all our hearts, but He's knocking on your door today and saying, Child, daughter, son, come to me. Come to me, come to me and let me be your Lord and Savior. Let me break the hold of those sins and let me make you brand new. So if that is you, I'd like you to raise your hand today. I'm not out to embarrass you, I'm not out to put the spotlight on you. But it's just a show so I know that you are there and I can pray with you. Is there anyone who's saying I'd like to make Jesus the Lord of my life today? Today is a great day to do it. A day when the Holy Spirit is here breaking strongholds of sin. Hallelujah. The second call I'd like to make is for people that are particularly struggling with a particular sin. You've done all you know how to do. You've done all you know how to do. You've, thank you. You prayed. You fasted. You cried out. You've done pursuit of God. You've done all you know how to do. But that sin just seems to dog your steps. You know the Holy Spirit has come to Jesus' house today to break every stronghold, every stranglehold of sin. And so that if that is you, I'd like to invite you to come to the altar, to come. For the Holy Spirit is here breaking yokes, breaking strangleholds of sin. For of a truth, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So if that's you, I'd like to invite you forward. And the pastors are going to pray with you. And today, that stronghold will end. We'll walk in the truth and in the reality of the fact that he that is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, everything has become new. 
you know the enemy can sit there and tell you you know it's okay it's not okay for sin will keep you away from our God and nothing should keep us away from the love of God in Christ Jesus I'm no longer a slave to sin. Hallelujah. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. Till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God and the truth is not in us. Church, don't be a spectator. You might not be out here, but you and I know the secret sins in our heart. And so let us engage the Holy Spirit. Don't be a spectator. Let each one of us deal with our, with our life with God. Don't be a spectator. There is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, what a name. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus oh, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain. Yes. We are the army of the Lord. We are rising up. There's 
able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness father we celebrate you in this place father we thank you we bless you in Jesus name and before you sit down can we celebrate the gift and pass each other like to celebrate the gift and pass what a word in due season thank you please be seated It is now time for us to worship God with our offerings and our tithe. So can I please ask that you prepare your offerings and your tithe. And if you're also um, watching online, please don't forget to follow the instructions on your devices. If you're a guest, please don't feel compelled to give. But here at Jesus' house, giving is an act of worship for us. So as you prepare your tithes and offerings, I'll just read us a scripture. I read a scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 8, and it reads, Here is my point. A stingy sower will reap a meager harvest, but the one who sows from a generous spirit will reap an abundant harvest. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving, all because God loves hilarious generosity. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of everything, every moment, and in every way. He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do. Amen? Let's prepare our offerings. I'll give you a few seconds to prepare. Okay, shall we pray? Father, we bless you. Thank you, Father, for the ability and enablement you've given us to give back what belongs to you in the first place. 
we ask Almighty God that our sacrifices today will come up to you as a sweet aroma in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask, O oh God, for the grace just to serve you with what you've given to us, O oh Lord. Let your name be glorified in our giving, Almighty Father. Father, we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll leave you in the safe hands of the choir. By his stripes we are healed. By his nail pierced hands we're free. By his blood we're washed clean. Now we have the victory. The power of sin is broken. Jesus overcame. Because you know Jesus is king, yeah? Yeah, say, this is how I fight my battle. Jesus wins for you. Say, this is how I fight my battle. Your right hand, everybody say, this is how I This is how I win my battle. Yeah, this is how I win my battle. This is how I win my battle. Yeah, yeah. Next spot says like this. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Woo! It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Declare it, say it. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. Oh, 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 oh yes. I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. 
break it down. Listen, listen. When Pastor was preaching, there was something, you know, that she said. She said, remember that God loves you. How many of you remember that she said that? It may look like we are surrounded, but we are surrounded by him. It is his love that surrounds us. How many of us are excited? I've got nine seconds, eight seconds. Let's declare this, yeah? Say, it may look, it may look like I'm surrounded by love. So come on, come on, Jesus' house, let's go. I'm surrounded by the sun. Yeah, it may look like I'm surrounded. Oh, oh, it may look like I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded. Can we celebrate the Spirit of God that surrounds us? Can we celebrate our Lord Jesus who fills our lives and surrounds us? This is truly how we fight and how we win our battles. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Celebrate God as you take your seat. We really do thank God. And we thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit that sets us free from enslavement to sin. Amen. As we begin to bring the service to a close, I'm just going to take a, a couple of a few announcements. Uh, the Esther's mini-series takes place this Thursday. It's been spoken about over the last couple of weeks. It's the series on menopause redefined, but I understand it's open to women of all ages. So if you haven't already registered for that, women, please go ahead and register and the uh, link will be on the screen very shortly and do uh, take a picture or go ahead and register for that, ladies. And for men, the mentoring scheme is starting up as we get into the new term in September. Uh, the mentoring scheme, I had the privilege of being a part of it um, uh, earlier in the year, the last one that was run, and I can tell you gentlemen, that it really does help to reshape and redefine us as men of purpose, men of courage. And um, if you haven't of it yet, do consider going ahead and signing up to be a part of the session that starts on the 5th of September. And whilst we're in September, gentlemen, still, the Mandate Men's Conference is going to be running from the 26th of September through to the 28th. And I really want to encourage us to get the tickets for that because in this year of the overflow, being empowered, which is the theme of this year's conference, it really, really is going to transform our lives. And for both men and women, uh, the Malawi trip, which is our healthcare mission trip, is coming up in November from the 1st to the 10th of November. And it's open to healthcare professionals, but not just healthcare professionals, it's open to all of us. So you may very well have always wanted to go on uh, one of these trips. You've watched the videos coming back from Oyo State in Nigeria. You've watched the Masai Mare, uh, the, 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 the videos from Kenya. And um, this year, there are three different townships in Malawi that are going to be visited and where we're going to be outreaching. So please do go ahead and sign up to be a part of that as well. Um, I talked about the Mandate Conference and in the foyer there are going to be tickets available at the Mandate table. Also in the foyer are tables for the School of Disciples and Acts Week. We spoke about Acts Week earlier on and if you haven't uh, signed up for that, please go ahead to that table in the foyer and be a part of the rest of that outreach for the rest of this week, running all the way into Saturday. And um, even as we uh, round up now, I just really want to ask how many people last week received the weekly declaration that Pastor Agu did? Just wave your hands at me if you did that. Wasn't that so powerful? Absolutely. So please do look forward to the next one, which will be coming out uh, tomorrow. 
And um, if you do not receive it already, please let us know um, in the front of house so that we can make sure that you are appropriately signed up. The scripture for this week's declaration is taken from the book of John. John chapter 14, if I can have it on the screen, in the Message Bible. And we're going to read from verses 15 to 17. John chapter 14, 15 to 17. You're obviously going to get it as part of the weekly declaration. But right now, let's just go ahead and read that scripture together. Have we got it? Okay. So read with me, please. If you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. I will talk to the Father, and he'll provide you another friend so that you will always have someone with you. This friend is a spirit of truth. The godless world can't take him in because it doesn't have eyes to see him. Are you reading with me? I'm so sorry. Did I say the amplified? I meant to say the message. I'm so sorry. Please, let's go back to the message and let us read together. In fact, I'm not even going to read. I'm going to let you guys read. So are we there? One, two, three. Amen. And that friend is? Amen. Now, for everyone who's worshiping with us for the first time, either uh, online, but more uh, to the point, anyone who's worshiping in the uh, auditorium this afternoon for the very first time at Jesus' house, please wave your hand at me so I can see you where you are. I see all of those hands. Thank you. God bless you. Jesus' house, can we appreciate them? If you're sitting around them, can you love on them? and uh, just cause them to experience the Jesus House love, the hand of fellowship here in Jesus House. The gentlemen and the ladies in the aisles are going to usher you to our hospitality lounge to experience some Jesus House hospitality. And once again, Jesus House, as they go, let's put our hands together and let us just celebrate them and thank them for coming to be with us this afternoon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. And can I just invite us all to rise up to our feet and we're going to close with a word of prayer. Our Father, our God, we really do thank you from the depths of our hearts for the freedom that we have received from enslavement of sin by the power of your Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you for dwelling on the inside of us. We ask that as we go into the week ahead that you will fill our lives and cause us to do exploits in your name. That your kingdom will be built up as a result of the ministration of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name we have prayed. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless. <laughs>